So last class we went out in the field and we got an idea of the sense of the time scale that we're going to talk about uh, cosmological time periods. And we talk about billions of years. We're talking about, in this case, the the time since the origination of the universe, which is about 13.8 to 15 billion years ago. Uh, and so today we're going to talk about that, that actual event about the Big Bang, about the origin of the universe uh, that we alluded to last class. And this graphic here is just going to give you a real quick snapshot of what the, the times involved were. And so about 15 billion years ago, uh, we have this Big Bang, a bunch of energy expanding. Uh, and you can see that at least the, the first couple things happened very, very quickly. 10 to the negative 32 seconds, uh, 10 to the negative 6 seconds. So we're talking about uh, fractions of fractions of fractions of fractions of nanoseconds. Uh, a lot of things were going on early on. Uh, then it started to slow down a little bit as the universe started to get a little bit bigger. So 13.8 billion years ago or so, Give or take, uh, give or take a couple million years, uh, maybe a couple hundred million years. Uh, but we we imagine the universe uh, as the size of an atom, and really even the size of an atom is too big. Because when we talk about what the universe was before the Big Bang, it's what we call a singularity. And a singularity, it's it's like when you talk about a. a the idea of a point in math, the true point is dimensionless. It's a, it's a point in space that has no volume, no size, and that's really what we're talking about here. And then we have this very violent, very rapid expansion. When we talk about the Big Bang, we're really talking about an expansion. And so all of the energy that's at this singularity, at this point in space, suddenly expands and expands incredibly rapidly. And as the energy expands, it starts to cool off. And so you can imagine uh, something like the sun. Well, it's, it's not ideal. It's the closest thing we can, can get to a good example of this. We have this uh, very energetic location in space like the sun when, when stars start to die they start to expand and as they expand they start to cool down because you have essentially the same amount of energy but now it's spread over a larger area and so the amount of energy at any one point is less and so we kind of see that as a change in temperature that's how we observe it so initially it's incredibly hot and as it expands out it starts to cool down uh, as the space gets bigger. Now, when we talk about before the Big Bang, and there was nothingness. You know, it's it's kind of hard to comprehend this idea because when we think about things like space and like time and matter and distances, that those are things that we've developed to explain the world around us. But when we look at this stuff, this is all stuff that has come about since this expansion. Before the expansion, there was no universe. There was no space. There was no matter. It was true, pure nothingness. Now, this is a, a quick little uh, minute physics just talks about where was the, the Big Bang? Where was the origination? Where did it start? Where did everything expand from? The universe is expanding, so does that mean there's a center from which everything is stretching outwards? I mean, it looks like the center is here because this point didn't move when we scaled, but we could just as easily have watched the scaling from this star, or this one, and they each look like the center. In fact, any time you scale anything up or down, there's no real center to the scaling. I mean, this square was clearly scaled up from its center. I mean, its corner. I mean, that point over there. The point is, sure, there may be points that stay in the same place because of your frame of reference, which is why it appears to us as if the Earth is the center of the expansion of the universe. But to someone in the Andromeda galaxy, it would appear that they were the center of the expansion. In short, if you're too close-minded to view the universe from different perspectives, it's easy to think you're at the center of the universe. Maybe that's the universe's way of making us all feel special. 
but really, we're not. And so this is something that we as humans have been guilty of many times over history, thinking that uh, our country or our, our area or our planet is the center of everything, is the center of the universe, when in reality it's not. And, and what the idea here is that where we're at, if we make observations, it looks like everything is expanding out and away from us. And so that would lead one to believe that, well, if everything's expanding out and away from us, that means that we must be in the center and everything is expanding out from here. But the reality is that if we go to another place in the solar system or in the universe, you're going to have that same effect. You're going to get the same thing going on where you it appears that everything is expanding out from that point from that location. So it's really all a matter of perspective. Now, if we look roughly three minutes after the Big Bang, we see that the universe has grown uh, to a little bit bigger than a grapefruit, and now we've started to cool down enough so that the energy can start to condense into matter. And, and the equation that really governs this process of matter arising from energy is Einstein's famous equation equals mc squared. And this tells us uh, the mass of the matter that's going to arise when energy gets converted into matter. And what we find is that this kind of process actually occurs quite frequently throughout the universe, throughout space, but it only occurs with very small particles. You don't see uh, trucks spontaneously uh, generate from matter. You have subatomic fundamental particles, electrons, quarks. Uh, there are many, many fundamental particles that we see that arise from uh, from that, from energy, and also the, the reverse actually occurs. This matter can, can basically turn back into energy uh, in the right conditions. And so as the energy started to spread out and the temperature started to decrease, this process started to happen. So we get electrons forming. We started to get protons and neutrons form. And then as there was continued cooling, as the... Uh, as the space in the universe continued to expand, these subatomic fundamental particles started to come together to form atoms. So fast forward to several hundred thousands of years after the Big Bang, three or four hundred thousands of years afterwards, now the temperature has started to drop enough that, that as we just said, that process we were just talking about, formation of atoms can occur. The energy is dispersed enough. The the temperature, I guess, is the is as we would think of it, has cooled down enough so that those particles can form atoms. Since hydrogen and helium are the most basic elements, they're the most basic nuclei and atoms. Those are the ones that get formed first. Your basic hydrogen atom is really nothing more than just a a proton with an electron flying around it. Uh, we can have isotopes of hydrogen, uh, isotopes with one proton and one neutron, an isotope with one proton and, and two neutrons, those are what we call deuterium and tritium. And they're chemically the same, you've hopefully learned about isotopes in chemistry. So chemically they're the same, they just happen to have slightly different atomic masses. Uh, but those are the easiest elements to put together, and then helium, which is two protons and two neutrons. So our early universe uh, in this kind of three to five hundred thousand year old range was about three quarters hydrogen and about a quarter helium. And really that's it, you know, as, as far as atoms go. There wasn't anything bigger. Uh, as we'll see in a little bit, those bigger elements were formed in stars. And so at this point we hadn't had any we we hadn't have had not had any stars 
that had been created, and those stars hadn't gone through this process of fusion, so we haven't fused anything larger. So we have our most basic elements, hydrogen and helium. And the interesting thing is that, that really that percentage hasn't changed significantly. Uh, it's still a vast majority of the elements in the universe are hydrogen, the second most is helium. And so, uh, even after 13.8 billion years, because there's so much mass, because there's so much matter, you, you think about how much stuff that's not hydrogen and helium that we have just on Earth. And then you have all these other planets, then you have the, the exoplanets, then you have planets around other stars, and those make up an enormous amount of mass and matter, but it's still just a drop in the bucket when you compare it to the overall matter in the universe. And the overall matter in the universe is still overwhelmingly hydrogen. And it's hydrogen that we find in stars because all of our stars are made up of mostly hydrogen with some helium. And the, the stars, the, the, the volume and mass of stars in the universe it just incredibly overwhelms the matter and mass and volume of everything else combined. So as we continue to progress, now, now that we have these giant clouds of hydrogen and helium, they start to coalesce. They start to come together. And by this point now, we have those fundamental forces. We have electrostatic force. We have the strong nuclear force. We have the weak nuclear force. And we have gravity. And now is where gravity becomes so important because gravity, even though it's an incredibly small, incredibly weak force relative to our other three, the gravitational force is what slowly starts to pull all of our hydrogen and our helium atoms together. The gravitational force between two hydrogen atoms pulls them together and then that slightly larger gravitational force starts to pull more hydrogens in and this is an incredibly long process but over time you get this large cloud of hydrogen and helium gas and then over more time that cloud starts to condense and get tighter and tighter and tighter until eventually it reaches this critical mass where it ignites and fusion starts and now we finally have our first stars and these stars were enormous. These stars dwarfed even the biggest stars that we know of currently because there was so much hydrogen and helium and it was so much closer together than it is now. Now we have this matter spread over hundreds of thousands and millions and literally billions of light years across the universe. And in this time, at this point, that matter, all of this matter was spread over only 400 million light years, really. And so it was much more dense. And so you had much larger stars. There were fewer of them, fewer of them but they were enormous. And in those stars, we start to form the first larger elements. We get it this fusion process where we get lithium and we get beryllium and then we get up into some of our larger elements. And these stars are so massive and they're burning so hot that they actually have relatively short lifespans for stars until eventually they go supernova and they explode and they send all of these larger elements out into the universe to form more stars and more stars. And this cycle repeats over and over and over and over again as the universe is continuing to expand. Until a crucial time for us. 4.6 billion years ago, our sun comes into being. Our sun, the sun that gives us life and light comes into being. And shortly thereafter, because of its massive gravitational force, which is due to its size, our planet starts to undergo a process called accretion, which is basically just the, the formation of the planet. And our solar system comes into existence. 
And at first, our Earth, and we'll get into this a lot more later on, but at first, our Earth is just this ball of hot molten metal and, and material, nickel and iron and uranium and all the other elements that make up the Earth now. We're just rolling around in this three-dimensional sphere of molten magma until it starts to cool down and, and form a crust and turn into the Earth that we know. Now, some things to understand uh, that, are, that are significant about the Big Bang uh, that are often misconstrued or misconceptions about the Big Bang. There wasn't an explosion. We call it the Big Bang, but there was no bang. It was an expansion. Uh, we start with a singularity. It's not like we lit a stick of dynamite and tossed it into a field and exploded and then there's a universe. It was this energy at this singularity there was a very rapid expansion and the expansion is still continuing and this is one of the pieces of evidence that supports our theory on the big bang is that we look at the universe now and we see that it's continuing to expand and so it's not an explosion it's an expansion instead of the balloon popping as we say here it's the balloon when you blow it up and it's expanding and getting bigger and bigger and bigger and kind of along with that, our singularity wasn't a, it wasn't like a little fireball. It wasn't like a, a little ball of energy that we could see that was somewhere in space. Space actually started, it began, it was not in existence before the singularity. It started in that singularity. And as we mentioned, before that, there was nothing. There wasn't space, there wasn't time, there wasn't matter, there was absolute nothing. Now, this all is well and good, and it's a fantastic theory, but as with anything in science, science is empirical. Science relies on evidence. Science doesn't just make grand claims like it invented the question mark and not support it with some type of evidence. And so there's some pretty significant evidence that the Big Bang is a, is a reasonable theory. There's stuff to back it up. And so let's talk about those uh, a little bit here. The first is, is what we just mentioned, this idea of universal expansion. And it was first really spelled out by Edwin Hubble, uh, who developed Hubble's Law. Of course, he named it after himself. And you guys are going to do a, a, an activity after you view these notes uh, related to Hubble's Law, where you can actually graph some distances and some speed and see that relationship. But essentially, what he saw is that the majority of the galaxies around us are moving away from us. So they're getting further away and they're getting further away from each other. And we'll actually do a lab where we see how this is possible. And what he also saw is that the farther away, the faster they got further away from us. And so from his perspective, the closest galaxies to us were moving the slowest. The furthest away were moving the fastest. And so what he was kind of able to do then is uh, work backwards, and, and if, if this process had been occurring for the eternity of the universe, that eventually we could work back and we could find a place where all of the matter and everything was in one place at one time, and that would then be the singularity. Now, the, the, the information that he used is this thing called redshift, and it's, it's a Doppler effect. Uh, kind of idea. As the light is is shining off of these or out of these stars and out of these galaxies, it's moving towards us, but the galaxies are moving away, and this causes the light to be shifted towards the red end of the spectrum. Essentially, what's going on is the wavelengths are getting stretched out, and so waves that or light that left a star that was the light was in the green wavelength. As that galaxy is moving away, it's getting stretched out, and so we observe it as a red wavelength, because the wavelength is what determines what color of the star, what color light is that we observe. And so this idea of redshift is how Hubble was first able to make these calculations based on, uh, or how did he able to make these calculations about velocity, and that's what you're going to be doing. You're going to be looking at a chart that gives you the redshift, and it'll it'll tell you. Uh, what that shift corresponds to as far as speed, and then you're going to do some graphing and see what that relationship is. 
Then we have the background radiation, and this is the the big piece of the 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 origins video, the back to the beginning. It talked a lot about this background radiation. It's what that Kobe satellite went up to, to observe, and it's what later the WMAP satellite went up to observe. And it was observing, hopefully you got this from the video, it was, it was measuring the microwave radiation. And it was measuring the amount of microwave radiation that was coming from certain areas. Uh, it was also it, then correlating that amount of background radiation to the amount of mass in that area. And what it found then is that there was a, a really good correlation. So the more radiation, the more mass. And so that led us to a lot of conclusions about, um, about the early universe. And this is a, a qu another quick um, minute physics. This one talks about how not only does the amount of light or the amount of electromagnetic radiation tell us information about the early universe, but also the polarization or the orientation of those microwaves. Light is a wave, and as it travels, it does its waving along a certain direction. It's polarization. Polarization, among other things, heavily influences the way light bounces and scatters. That's why horizontally polarized light reflects off a lake or car windshield, which in turn is why sunglasses with a vertical polarizing filter can block that light. And in the hot plasma of the baby universe, light was bouncing off of electrons left and right, until the plasma cooled enough to become transparent so the light could start traveling through space. But before heading out on its 13 plus billion year journey, this light bounced one last time off of the plasma, and the direction each photon went was influenced by how its polarization interacted with the precise temperature, density, and motion of the plasma. So if we measure the polarization of light coming from this cosmic background radiation, it can tell us about the Big Bang. The details are complicated, but roughly speaking, clumps in the plasma of the early universe created polarizations aligned along or across the direction from hot spots to cold spots in the plasma, while jiggles created polarization at 45 degree angles to the hot-cold direction. And by jiggles, I mean the stretching and squeezing of space due to gravitational waves passing through. Anyway, starting with the results from the BICEP telescope at the South Pole, we see that while a majority of the polarization came from clumps in the early universe, about 15% of it seems to come from jiggles. And these jiggles are a big deal. They were created just fractions of fractions of a second into the life of the universe by quantum fluctuations of the gravitational field. So not only does their discovery mark the first confirmation that gravity is indeed a quantum mechanical phenomenon, but it also opens the door for us to look 380,000 years farther back than ever before, into the very birth of our cosmos. Congrats to the BICEP collaboration, assuming of course that their results are confirmed by other experiments. Okay, so uh, another cool piece of this. And then this we uh, talked, we saw this in the, the video, but on the left side here, this is the Kobe image. You can see how uh, kind of unclear it is. And Tyson's in the video likened it to having a, an image behind a screen or a picture behind a screen, right? And so you could make out that it was a person and that he was behind there, but you couldn't really make out any features. It was very vague. And then WMAP came along, and you can see how much clarity increased just from 1992, the Kobe satellite, to the WMAP satellite 11 years later. And then just recently, uh, I think I may have mentioned it last class, the European Space Association sent up another satellite called the Planck satellite, uh, after Max Planck, and this here on the far right is the image that it sent back. And you can see, again, another 10 years later, and, and better technology and improved lenses and improved electronics, how much more clarity we have on this background microwave radiation and how much detail there is in this image. Just going ac and across the last 20 years, how far we've come from the Kobe image over here on the far left to our Planck image, which is 
is now the one that scientists are working on here in the far right and how much more information they can get from this because of that clarity, because of that detail that they have. So that's, I think, pretty cool. And then our third piece of evidence are quasars. And we'll talk more about quasars when we get into stars. But essentially, they're these giant, giant, giant cores. And, and, and cores we're just talking here about basically place where we have a whole bunch of matter and it, and it started out probably as a star and it pulled in a bunch more matter and now it's super massive it's also very very large and so uh, it has a lot of mass similar to a black hole but it's not as dense as a black hole and that that's kind of what separates it it's the the smaller density is why it's doesn't have as much gravitational pull, which is why light escapes. But if you see the kind of on this image, how the light is coming out the top and the bottom, and this is really what uh, what is unique about quasars is they have these pulses of light coming out of along the axes of rotation. So you can see it's it's rotating around this axis, and there's a beam of energy just pouring out of the the top and bottom of this. And as it spins, uh, as they spin around, it's kind of like a, a lighthouse spinning around. And so from Earth, we're able to measure these, these pulses as they spin around, kind of like if you're looking at a lighthouse with that light spinning around, you can see it as it comes around. Uh, but these are the, some of the largest uh, things, some of the largest uh, objects that we've found in the galaxy, or in the universe rather, but they're also the farthest away. They're only found in that 10 to 13, 10 to 14 billion light year uh, distance from us, which means that they had to be formed at the very earliest stages of time. And, and the only kind of conditions that could have accounted for that would be that much denser matter and, and uh, high amount of of helium and hydrogen forming together to form these supermassive objects. And then when we look at these that are, are in this range 10 to 13 billion light years away, they're also the farthest things that we see. We don't see anything past them. There aren't any stars past them. We have some incredibly powerful telescopes and we pick up light from stars that are from these quasars and we don't find anything past them. And it's not because our, our telescopes can't pick them up, it's because there's nothing there. Then we have our, our stellar formation and evolution. And this kind of relates to that idea that if something has occurred in a similar fashion for millions, maybe billions of years, the chances are that it has been occurring like that for the previous maybe 10 or 15 billion years. And so as we observe the life cycle of stars, and while we can't observe a single star go through its entire life cycle, we can see uh, average stars. We can see like, like our sun is a, a kind of a mid-life star. It's a mid-sized star. We see red giants, which are stars that are on their way out. We observe supernovas and black holes, which are stars dying. We see the stellar nebulas and we see the protostars as they, you know, we see stars that are in those stages. And so we can't observe the star, an individual star, go through those because the timeline is so long. We see stars that are in those different stages. And from that, we can deduce how a star is born, lives, and eventually dies. And that kind of leads us through the, the alchemy piece that in stars we have these these giant furnaces where all of these elements are forged. And in the supernovas, we have the really big elements formed. And if we kind of trace that back, we can get an idea that, that this had to have happened over a very long period of time to form the elements that we had. And it wasn't just a couple cycles. And if it was longer than, than what we estimate, then there would be less of that hydrogen and helium. And so a lot of conclusions can be drawn based on the life cycle of our stars. And then the last piece, and this kind of relates to the, the quasars as well. We know that the speed of light is 2.9 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. Okay? That means that it travels 
2.9 times 10 to the 8th meters every second. We're about 8 light minutes from the sun. So the light from the sun, it leaves the surface of the sun. It takes about 8 minutes to get to the surface of the earth. Uh, when we talk about light years, that's a distance. The light year is the distance that it takes for a, a photon of light. Uh, or it's, it's the distance that a photon of light travels in one year. As I just mentioned, we look out with some incredibly powerful telescopes, and we see things that are 10, 11, 12, 13 billion light years away. Okay? When we look at something that's 500 light years away, or 600 light years away, or a million light years away, that's not only looking at something that's far away, it's also looking at something that's that old. If something is 500 light years away, when the light gets to us, that light has been traveling for 500 years, which means that the light we see is 500 years old, which means that the thing that we're observing, we're observing it as it was 500 years ago. It might not be there by now. All right? When we look at stars that are a billion light years away, that light has been traveling for a billion years. There is a chance that that star has already gone supernova and is no longer in existence and hasn't existed for thousands, if not millions of years. But we won't know for another eight or 900 million years if that happened. So in a sense, we're looking back in time when we look up at the night sky. As I mentioned, we don't see anything past 10 to 13 billion light years away. And it's not for lack of trying. It's not because we don't have strong enough telescopes. It's because there's nothing there. It's because beyond that distance, there is no universe. There is no space. There is nothing because the universe hasn't expanded out into it yet. And so that's kind of a, a, a crazy thing to think about. There is an edge of the universe. There is a, a space where the universe hasn't reached yet but we could never it's not like we could ever get past or get to the edge of the universe because even if we left now it would take us about 13 if it, let's say by some struck stroke of genius some amazing whatever we find some way to travel at the speed of light even if we're traveling at the speed of light it's going to take us 14 billion years to get to the edge of the universe. Now, in 14 billion years, what's going to have happened? Well, that edge of the universe is going to be 14 billion years more expanded, right? And so it's it, it's not really even worth the, well, what if we got to the edge of the universe, what we see kind of question, because it's not a, a feasible, plausible thing. So, and now last thing, uh, just to, to leave you with from this set of notes, a little bit more about that background radiation and the idea that it is actually the oldest light in the universe because it's from right after the Big Bang. And so the idea of the cosmic background radiation is actually even older than the starlight from those super far away stars because the background radiation was formed even before the first stars. It was formed uh, up to 400 million years before, or 400,000 years before the first stars were formed. If you look up at the night sky in any direction, past all the stars and more stars and galaxies and superclusters of galaxies, you will see light that has been traveling for 13.7 billion years to reach Earth. It's the oldest and most primeval light in the universe, a picture of our cosmos in its hot, younger years, and it's called the cosmic background radiation. Of course, you can't really see this light with your naked eyes because it's in the microwave band of the electromagnetic spectrum, but it is visible to radios and radio telescopes, and even makes up a small portion of the salt and pepper on an analog TV. Where does this luminescent background come from? Well, just after the Big Bang, the entire universe was still so small it would have been very dense, scorchingly hot, and because it hadn't yet had time to get rough and uneven, it would also have been scrumptiously smooth. For a while, things would have been so sweltering that electrons didn't settle down as parts of atoms or molecules, but instead roamed freely in a kind of red-hot cosmic soup. That soup would have had lots of light bouncing around it too, scattering off of electrons and protons like a hall of mirrors. However, as the universe expanded, there was less and less energy to be had in any one place. And when things had cooled to just below the temperature of the sun, pairs of electrons and protons no longer had the energy to resist each other, and they fell into the electromagnetic embrace we call the hydrogen atom. 
These electrons were so enamored by their new proton love interests that they effectively began to ignore all the light bouncing around them. So with fewer free electrons for light to interact with, the universe suddenly became transparent, and all the pent-up light was sent forth in whatever direction it had been headed after its last scattering, doomed to travel alone and unnoticed through the cosmos. That is, until it bumps into something solid. When we finally see it here on Earth, this light has been stretched so much by the 13 billion year expansion of space that, like a record slowing down, its frequency and color have shifted from the original sunlight white all the way to cool microwaves. Thus, it's often called the cosmic microwave background radiation, or CMB. And just as we can tell the temperature of a red or white hot iron from its glow, this light tells us the temperature of empty space, currently around 2.725 Kelvin, or minus 270 degrees Celsius. However, the universe isn't exactly 2.725 Kelvin in every direction. If we look closely, there are small and seemingly random but noticeable bumps all over the place, kind of like milk that's starting to curdle. Our best understanding is that these cosmic curds formed as quantum fluctuations in the otherwise creamy infant universe, and then began to coagulate as the universe cooled and expanded. It's hard to overstate just how small or unbumpy these fluctuations of temperature and density were to begin with. The hot or cold spots were only hotter or colder than their surroundings by a factor of about 1 in 100,000. That's like noticing that a bacteria makes a beach ball bigger. But while this clumping of the universe initially resulted in small variations like the ones we see in the CMB, later on the chunky curds of primordial soup attracted each other gravitationally, and they ultimately coagulated and coalesced to form all of the massive structures in the universe that we see today, like planets, stars, galaxies, and superclusters of galaxies. So when we look up at the night sky past those galaxies and see the ancient light of the cosmic microwave background radiation, we're literally seeing the starting point, the proverbial cream, if you will, from which the starry curds of the universe congealed. Or quite simply, proof that the moon really is made of cheese. <laughs>